Hi everybody, it's Miss Hamill and I'm here to talk to you about biology and really give you a EOC review. Um, my hope is that you will watch these videos and take a short quiz after each video and get the content or have a better understanding of the content that you need to know for the biology EOC which you will be taking at the end of April this year. The first unit that we are going to study is the scientific method. You need to be able to discuss the relationship between science and society throughout time, explain the scientific method and experimental design. So you need to know the dependent and independent variables, the controls and constants. You need to understand how scientists conduct experiments safely in the laboratory and in the field, and discuss the difference between living and non-living things. So the first question I'm going to ask you is, what is life? Well, biology is the study of living things, and all living things are going to share eight common characteristics. They are, all living things are made of cells, which is part of the cell theory. Two, reproduction. All living things are going to reproduce some way, somehow. They are, or they have the ability to reproduce, either asexually, sexually or bacteria, they will reproduce through binary fission. Metabolism is the third common characteristic. It is the use of energy. So they can, organisms are going to use energy through cellular respiration and or photosynthesis. All living things are going to try to maintain homeostasis, which is a stable, constant conditions within their living system. Organisms are going to respond to a stimuli. So, for example, a plant is going to grow towards the sun, towards the light. All living things contain DNA. If you remember, um, eukaryotic cells contain their DNA within their nucleus. This is the universal genetic code that all organisms are going to share. Um, prokaryotic cells have the DNA within the cytoplasm. All living things are going to evolve or adapt to their environment, and all living things are going to grow and develop. So think about any living thing, they're going to fall under these categories. They, have, they share all of these characteristics or have the ability to share these characteristics. All right, next we're going to talk about the scientific method. And this is really the common process that all scientists use when designing an experiment. So the first step is for a scientist to come up with a question. What do they want to research? What are they curious about? What do they want to learn? Then they are going to gather information. They're going to research that topic. They'll go to books, um, scientific literature, the internet, and they're going to try to find out what has already been done in that field of research. Based on that research, they are going to formulate a hypothesis, which is going to be a statement, a testable statement, that predicts what is going to happen in their experiment. Then they are going to conduct their experiment using exact procedures that are repeatable. They are going to collect their data and analyze their data. Then they are going to um, come up with the conclusions, and then they're going to share their results with other scientists through peer revisions. And scientists share their work and collaborate so the scientific community can learn from one another. So first off, what is a hypothesis? As I said, it is a testable statement that shows how you think the manipulated variable will affect or might affect the dependent variable. It is a possible solution to the question that you asked, and it is an if-then statement. It's not just an educated guess. It's a little bit more than that. So you need to know the difference between an independent and dependent variable. So first, the independent variable are the variables that are purposefully changed or manipulated. They are going to be on the x-axis. The dependent variable is going to change in response to the independent variable, and this is what you measure. This is on the y-axis. So I'm going to give you a little mnemonic to help you remember the dependent and independent variable. So if you remember from the beginning of the year, 
I said try to remember D R Y dependent responds on the Y axis and then M I X which is manipulated independent on the x-axis. So if you're stuck, just think of dry mix and hopefully that can help you remember the difference between the independent and dependent variable. So if we are going to conduct an experiment here about whether or not fertilizer helps to make a plant grow, the independent variable would be the amount of fertilizer placed on the plant. The dependent variable would be the growth of the plant. Okay, constants controls, what's the difference? A constant is going to be factors that remain the same and they're not allowed to change in the experiment. They're going to limit the variability in the experiment. The control is a part of the experiment that serves as a standard for comparison. So if we use the fertilizer and how it affects the growth of plants, the control would be the plant that did not receive any fertilizer. The experimental groups would be the plants that got different amounts of fertilizer. The dependent variable would be the growth. And the constants would be factors that have to remain the same as well between all groups. So it would be um, the type of plant, the amount of sunlight, the amount of water, the temperature. Um, so all the different variables or factors that could affect the growth of the plant. All right, so now we're going to talk about different types of data, qualitative and quantitative data. What's the difference? Well, qualitative data are going to be data that you observe during the experiment that is really a quality so like color um, it doesn't really have much to do with numbers quantitative data is going to be numbers in the form of raw data and it's displayed in tables and graphs it's what you measured in the experiment and how do you represent your data is by putting them on a graph and there are different types of graphs. Um, the most common that we use in our class is a bar graph and a line graph. So there are two types of data. One is discrete data. The second is continuous. Discrete data are typically categorical data. So it could be like the days of the week, um, a brand of something, and the intervals between the data have no meaning. So you could say Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or you could say Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Monday. It doesn't affect the outcome of the experiment. Continuous data are associated with measurements involving a standard scale. So the measurement should be able to show some sort of trend or relationship and the intervals have meaning. With discrete data, you're going to use a bar graph with continuous data, you will use a line graph. So graphs are super important to really show the meaning of your data. And graphs all have very specific parts that make them uh, meaningful. So the first is a title. And a good title is typically the effect of the independent variable on the dependent variable. And when we are making our graph, the dependent variable is going to go on the y-axis or the vertical axis, and the independent variable will go on the horizontal axis or the x-axis. And the axes must have a appropriate scale and labels. So first you need to, as I said, construct your graph. You need to make your axes. And we're going to use a hypothetical experiment here. And we're going to talk about how many scoops of calcium chloride, the amount of calcium chloride, changes the water temperature. So what we are measuring, or the dependent variable, is the water temperature. What we are changing, or manipulating, or the independent variable, is the amount of calcium chloride. 
when you make a graph and you are going to make a scale so that that is how the numbers are arranged and it has to make sense so for here we used scoops of calcium chloride we did them by twos and then for temperature we increased by fives it made sense for the experiment last thing we're going to talk about is the difference between a theory and a law so what's the difference between a scientific theory and a law of course you're going to learn a lot about scientific theories in this class we have the cell theory the theory of evolution and we'll talk about some laws as well a theory is going to be based on repeated observations and investigations while a law is basically observations of similar events that have been observed repeatedly. If I drop an apple, it's going to fall to the ground based on the law of gravity. A theory, new information can modify or reject that theory. While with a law, many new observations that do not follow the law, therefore the law would then be rejected. A theory is going to attempt to explain why something happens. Why did the organisms change over time? The theory of evolution. The law is going to state that something will happen. If I drop an apple, it's going to fall. The law of gravity. A theory is usually more complex than a law. It is based on many well-supported hypotheses, where a law is typically based on one really well-supported hypothesis and states that something will happen. So again, a theory is really explaining why something happens, and a law is stating that something will happen. All right, so that is your first video about the scientific method. I want you to now go ahead and take the quiz on Edline. Good luck. I hope you have a better understanding. If you do not, go ahead and rewatch the video. Happy studying.